welcome to episode 135. Have you been thinking it's time to get away, but planning the trip is half the battle? Then let the travel specialist at 3D Travel Company plan your getaway today. Just head to my website, www.whodidthatvoice.co, and click the 3D Travel Company logo on our homepage to get your free quote today. Welcome to Who Did That Voice, the show where we take an in-depth look at voiceover. And now, here's your host, Trenton Larkin. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today is the 135th episode of Who Did That Voice, and it sadly marks the end of an era for the Who Did That Voice family. To each and every one of my listeners around the world, I can't thank you enough for being with me during this two-year journey. In August of 2016, August 5th of 2016 to be exact, I launched Who Did That Voice with the very first four episodes of the show, and every week since then, on Friday and sometimes more, I have launched an episode faithfully every Friday at least uh, since August 5th of 2016. So August 16th, uh, August of 2016 to August of 2018, we have run this show two years faithfully for you guys. And sadly, it has come to an end. Uh, recently, my mother was diagnosed with leukemia. And uh, of course, my world went into a tailspin of craziness, uh, as some of you may be familiar with this, you know, when you've had a, a family member that's gone through something of a health issue that's more severe than anything you've ever dealt with in your life. I know uh, it's brought a lot of thought processes for me to think about the future uh, with potentially not having my mother around. And, you know, it's brought a lot of tears, a lot of sadness. And uh, I just can't focus on who did that voice like I should be able to on a regular basis time frame without something like this happening to continue to bring you guys the quality show that I've brought you the last two years. So I need a break for now. Uh, this may not be goodbye forever, uh, but it may, uh, you know, I don't fully know yet. I've had so many wonderful people sending so many, uh, so much love and prayers and, and great vibes and wonderful thoughts my way. Uh, it's been overwhelming and I can't thank you guys enough uh, for all of your kind words and for everything you've done uh, for your prayers and everything. Um, so I just wanted to thank my Who Did That Voice family more than anything before we get into today's episode as it is our last. Um, you know, it's really sad, but you know, sometimes uh, chapters in our lives come and chapters in our lives go. Uh, but I know the legacy that I have built with this show has been unlike anything I could have ever dreamed uh, it would have been when I started two years ago. I can say I've learned more doing this um, radio show, podcast, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I've learned more doing this than I've learned in so many things I've done in my life. It's been an amazing, wonderful, joyful ride. I've met so many wonderful people, uh, including, uh, you know, my announcer, Mike Greco, and so many of the wonderful people who have been involved with my show, whether they've been special guests on the show or not. So thank you to each and every one of my special guests. Uh, thank you to each and every one of my listeners. You know, as I go through this trying time, uh, and as it may be the final chapter completely for Who Did That Voice, um, you know, I hope you guys enjoyed the ride. I hope you guys enjoyed learning um, about the actors behind the voices, getting to know their stories. And, you know, I tried to just ask the questions, sit back and let them talk because the show is not about me. It's about my guests, my special guests that come on the show. And uh, I hope it was educational, fun and entertaining. And I hope the projects that they've been a part of, those who have been on my show, the next time you watch them, play them, listen to them, I hope it changes your perspective on the shows, uh, video games and radio dramas or whatever they're a part of that the next time you you are participating in that medium that they have been a part of it it makes it a difference in your life because I know it sure does for me uh, I never look at things the same after I've had a guest on the show and then to go oh my gosh I had them on the show it just it changes my whole outlook on things um, you know, I, I can't thank you guys enough again. Um, today's special guest is Stuart Pankin, the voice of Earl Sinclair from Dinosaurs. And we're going to dive into that with a clip as per usual. And uh, then we will start this amazing and final interview. I hope you guys all enjoy today's final interview on Who Did That Voice? I have been waiting in that car with your mother for 10 minutes. Just your mother and me, in the car, ten minutes. Run! 
I'm on my way. Thank you. Not the mama, not the mama. You do that one more time, and I'm going to throw you across the room. Mm, not the mama! Ah! Get up for once. Earl, feed the baby. Why? Because if you don't feed it, it'll die. How many other kids we got? Two. Who do you love? Mama. <sighs> Who do you love second best? Mama. All right. Who is talking to you right now? Not the mama. <laughs> I'm going upstairs. Ladies and gentlemen. Boys and girls. Welcome to Who Did That Voice? In just a moment, the show will begin. So, so please, please sit, sit back, back, relax, and, and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Who Did That Voice? Today on the show, I am super excited to be bringing you a man who has been shrunk down to the size of a molecule, Stuart Pankin. Stuart, thanks so much for joining us today. You're very welcome. Oh, wait, that's, that was my molecule voice. <laughs> Thanks. Fred. You're very welcome. Well, Stuart, Good to be here. thank you so much for giving me some of your time to chat with you. I'm super excited. Uh, you're definitely an actor who has touched my life through many of the projects that you've worked on as I've grown up. Uh, it's been amazing to, uh, to grow with you in your career and some things I wasn't even as familiar with uh, that I kind of discovered as I was preparing for this interview. Um, so the very first thing we like to do when we have a guest on the show is to get to know them, Stu. So tell me about little Stuart, the young boy that grew into the man he is today, and how did he become an actor? Ah. Uh. Uh, that's, do you, do you have some time? Um, <laughs> I know I, as a kid, I used to enjoy performing in front of my family, just, you know, singing and stuff like that. And yeah. We had no, we had no theater in, in, in high school or junior high school in Philadelphia because the, the auditorium collapsed. So there was no theater. Oh gosh. But I did a few, a few odds and ends, you know, in the, in the cafeteria, some plays and readings and things. But I really, I was going to be a psychology major, but I really got interested in theater in college when I, uh, I walked across the dark campus to audition for the first play that they that I was involved with, which was Our Town. And from that moment on, uh, I, I was hooked. I mean, I became an English major. There was no theater major in my college at the time. Oh, wow. So I became an English major, which my friends in the theater department said, that's the best thing to do for, for an actor, which is probably true. <laughs> I ended up going to Columbia and getting a master's degree in theater. So, I mean, I, I, I did, did do some concentration on that. But that's how I became an actor. I, got, I fell in love with it in college, and um, and I, I fell in love with my, my teacher, Dave Brubaker, who was my mentor, my, my teacher, and my friend for years. And uh, I just went on. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really awesome. Well, I appreciate you diving into just kind of some of the rudimentary, you know, fundamentals of how you became an actor. Uh, you know, when we get to know somebody's past, we really can kind of better understand their future a lot of times uh, through understanding who they are as a person and, and just how they got where they are. So thank you very much. Don't don't get to know me too well because, you know, I, I'm a very private person. <laughs> I understand. Well, Stu, thank you again so much for your time. Uh, you know, we're going to dive into a, a movie that I absolutely loved, a franchise that I loved growing up, the Honey, I Shrunk the Kid movies. Uh, you were in Honey, We Shrunk Ourselves in 1997 where you played, where you played Gordon Zielinski, Wayne's brother. Yep. Uh, what yep. was it like getting to work with Rick Moranis and that amazing cast and crew on that show? Great. It was <clears throat> it was great. Uh, Dean Cundy, who was Steven Spielberg's uh, DP for years, uh, all of a sudden broke out and, and directed this movie, which was the first made-for-video uh, movie I think ever made. I mean, to, that, that was made specifically to go direct to uh, to video. Really? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. Wow. And he was great. Rick Rick was great. Um, he uh, he's a very funny guy, very personable guy. And uh, the other kid, Robin, I, you know, you probably know better than I do, but uh, I always forget names because when you get to be my age, you just do that. <laughs> it's it's part of the thing. But the cast is great. There were about four of us who worked all the time, and it was mostly green screen and uh, and special effects and uh, and a couple of big props, which was fun. It, it, it was you know I had done some some green screen or blue screen stuff before when I did not necessarily the news, but this was this was 
practically entirely green steam, entirely special effects and really wow. Pre- pretending stuff was there and, and but and they had some really nice oversized props. But it was it was a treat. It was it was it was you know every day was was fun and and I was younger so everything was good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean I, I have nothing nothing. I mean we we laughed a lot uh, and uh, Rick I think his I think his wife had just died. God bless him and and he uh, or or his wife died soon after that and he sort of gave up uh, show business for a while to take care of his kids which I thought was yeah you know admirable. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. But but when we were together, it was um, it was great. It was it was a tremendous amount of fun. That's absolutely awesome. Well, you know, it's always been a, a funny set of movies that I've always enjoyed. I didn't realize that one never came to theaters because I remember Honey, We Blew Up the Kid was in theaters. So I guess I just didn't recall that one not actually going to theaters. I guess I kind of was like, oh, hey, it's on video, but I don't remember it hitting the theaters, you know, but back then no. publicity wasn't as hard as it is now. And there's not social media and all these other things where it could be, you know, mass spread out. You know, if you didn't catch a commercial on TV, you didn't know no. whether something was on the theater or not, or unless you were looking in the Sunday paper, that kind of stuff. But no, I didn't there was only that. two of them that went to, to the theaters, the first one and the second one. Okay. And ours and ours uh, never, never went to a theater. It was never intended to go to a theater. But it, it it's still, I mean, it's out there. You can buy it. You can watch it someplace. Uh, I got a, a a few copies of it. If anybody wants to send me a self address stamp, no, that's not. That's not, that's not gonna um, but it's, it's. I don't think it's been on um, on you know any of the 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 uh, what do you call it the the pay uh, system like Netflix, Netflix or, or any of those. I don't think so. Okay. I'm not sure because I know like dinosaurs is yeah. and a few other things and that I really didn't know you know ended up on on those systems but i i, I don't you know I, you, sometimes you get residuals and you see the names of the of the shows but you don't necessarily know where they're from yeah well i appreciate you diving into that and uh you know it was just always a film that i a film series that i absolutely loved growing up as a kid they were just wacky funny zany shows and uh, you yeah. know especially going to disney world you know they had the honey i shrunk the audience uh experience there for a while they don't have it now oh, did they? But yeah, Mm -hmm. you would go in and like there would be a shrink ray that would accidentally go off and then they would use all these different technologies like air and stuff and make it feel like you had shrunk down to the size of a mouse Mm. and like there would be stuff blown across your feet and you'd feel like a rat was going across and you just all kinds of funny stuff. But you know, Disney, they're very ingenuitive when they uh, create their projects. So it's pretty fun. Yeah, great. Well, the next thing we're going to talk about is something you've briefly just mentioned, uh, Dinosaurs, which came out in 1991. It was the TV sitcom live action with actual dinosaurs. Um, and you played <laughs> actual Earl Sinclair. dinosaurs, actual dinosaurs, not actual dinosaurs, but you know, uh, it was a, it was a live action show. It wasn't animated. Right. Um, but you played no. Earl Sinclair on that show and you, you didn't I actually did. wear the suit. You just voiced the character, right? That that's correct. Okay. Uh, there were three people involved in, in making, all of those uh, animatronic puppets work. There was a guy in the suit, uh, in my case, a guy named Bill Beretta, who is now a, a, a high executive in the Henson Company. Uh, and then there was a guy, to, then there was me who did the voice, and then there was a, a guy re- working the, uh, the eyes and the mouth from a, uh, from a console. <laughs> so it, it took three people to, to do any, any one puppet. Wow. That's a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of people. and It's a lot of great technology. I mean, depending on the show and the needs of the puppets, they could change the expression of the eyes and the mouth to whatever they needed to. If they needed a surprise, they'd push a button, and if they needed them to be sad, they'd push. It, it, it changed based on the script. Yeah. It was very complicated and very expensive. It was probably at the time, maybe still, the most expensive half-hour television show around. I, I've got to say, the, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I'm just going to say because of the maintenance of the animatronic puppets, yeah. which were very complicated and and very uh, <laughs> needful. I mean, yeah, they, they they needed a lot of care. Because they took a lot of punishment. Yeah, I bet they did. Well, I was just going to say, like, when their facial expressions happened, sometimes they made me crack up so much because they were just so over the top funny. Um, but, yeah. you know, and you mentioned it, 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 these are Jim Henson puppets, uh, but they're right. life size, human size. Uh, and they were just astronomically funny this show was one of the best i think half hour sitcoms you could ever watch and if you haven't seen it it's definitely one you need to see because stew's in it so <laughs> oh you you need to see it you need to go out it's on uh i think you can buy it it's on dvd all the entire the entire um you know three seasons were yeah. on uh, 
are, are available. So get them. I'd like to, you know, I'll get, like, get a check for 10 cents. It would be great. <laughs> yeah, well, I tell you what, Dinosaurs has always been one of those shows that left an imprint on me. Uh, you know, gotta love the baby. You know, like all of those sayings and just all the funny quirks and things that happen on that show. One of the best sitcoms I think I ever watched as a kid. And, uh, you know, for not being a cartoon, it was pretty cartoonish. So it's pretty awesome. Well, it was the nice thing about it, it was good for the kids because there were you know, all these anim- these puppets running around making faces and, and, and visually is very exciting. And then the content of it was, you know, they sneaked in all these uh, socially relevant things yeah. and things that, that the adults and parents would, 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 would enjoy. Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, like, uh, you know, Howard Ham up me. He was the, <laughs> he was the, uh, the broadcaster and, uh, give peas a chance about the, uh, I mean, there, there's so many uh, of, uh, of that type of thing, sexual, what sexual harass meant and talked about that kind of thing and drugs. They talked they did an episode about drugs. Yeah. Well, we did, we did a lot of them. I mean, it was like three, three seasons, about 60 or 70 shows of, you know, socially relevant and funny stuff. <laughs> yeah. I wish they would bring it back and bring you back as the voice. Cause I think that show Me could too. totally be revamped and retooled for the modern day. And I think it would be amazing. I, I think so too, except the, the problem is, like I said, it's very expensive yeah. to do. And I, and I, and I, I kept in touch for years with Michael Jacobs, who's a producer. And every once in a while, there's a, there's a groundswell of, uh, of interest in, among the audience of, of redoing that show. And he says, no, it's, it, it ain't going to happen. It's just, <laughs> it's too complicated, but yeah. yeah, my God, I, I mean, and I don't think if they made a cartoon of it, like an animated cartoon, it would have the impact. It might be, it might be cute, but it wouldn't have the impact that the, uh, that the original show had. I agree. Cause the animatronics are just what made that show so unique, yeah. those puppets, you know? So I yeah. agree with you on that. <laughs> um, wow. No, getting to talk with you on that is pretty awesome. Uh, for you getting to work on that show, it's a very unique, uh, sitcom TV sitcom. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, and, and not a lot of people have gotten to do something that out there, which I think is pretty, pretty cool that you got to voice the main character. So. No, I'm I, I'm extremely happy, extremely lucky, and yeah. uh, it was a job that I loved doing, I loved having. Absolutely. Well, you know, we're going to talk about some of your other projects that you've worked on. Uh, you've worked on some films that I actually loved growing up as a kid and did not realize or remember that you were in these, uh, but the Xenon movies, Xenon Girl of the 21st Century, uh, was a big yep. thing during the early mid nineties. And, uh, then right. of course there was the Xenon, the sequel and Xenon 23. And you played commander plank on all three of those films. Um, and, plank at your service. <laughs> and those were all Disney films of that era, the nineties. And, uh, you know, watching the Disney afternoons and, uh, watching these films, you know, there was just something about that era and the films and TV shows they produced. Uh, what was yeah. it like for you getting to work on those films, the Xenon movies? Well, you know, any the answer to any question you ask me about that starts with what was it like? It was great. I mean, I, as an actor, it's always great to work. Yeah. Uh, it was. We did it in Canada, which was which was kind of nifty. Uh, it was it was kind of it, it was a family oriented show. I mean, sort of quote science fiction show, so everybody could watch it, which is nice. And um, it, it was. This might be complicated, but it was like a buyout because we worked worked in Canada, so you get paid for for the show and then it goes away. And then Z Xenon three came along, and then all of a sudden the, the rules change so that you can actually make a a little bit of money from it. But besides the money, which of course I don't care about, uh, working working in those we we did them in we did them in three locations. The three movies we did one in Vancouver, we did one in New Zealand. And then we did one in South Africa. Wow. So that alone was was kind of an interesting, you know, trip around the world to uh, to do these movies. Wow, yeah. And and it gave me an opportunity to see an awful lot of nice places, and and to work with with you know I'm still friendly with uh, with Holly Fulger who was played my wife in three movies as an actor named Rob Curtis Brown, who was in the second movie. I you know we're still good friends to this day. John Getz I see occasionally. He was in one of the in one of those movies, the New Zealand movie. And uh, the kids, you know, I mean, they were kids, so we didn't hang out with the kids a lot. But uh, <laughs> they've gone on to, you know, Raven Simone and uh, and uh, Xenon. She's gone on to soap opera fame. I mean, so and, and the kids seem to love those Xenon movies. If I'm recognized by kids, yeah. Uh, because, and if if it's not Dinah, it's you know Xenon. 
is is up there uh, with with the uh, with the kids and the enjoyment of of those kids watching it. You know, so it's it was a great, and I'm still actually friendly with the with the writer of the all three of them, Stu Krieger, who I still see uh, uh, a lot. Well, that's awesome. You know, so it, so the, so it, it, there was a lot of I, you know it was professional benefits and a lot of social benefits. That's amazing. Well, I did not realize they'd all been filmed all literally around the world. Uh, that's yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of cool to be able to uh, to see, you know, all those places and to learn about some of those cultures. And and we had enough time off that we could travel around a little bit and and see some of that stuff. I mean, you know, that's one of the benefits of, of being an actor in, you know, 21st century. <laughs> you get to travel sometimes, yeah. you know, you, you know, places that you would never – you know, pick up and pack a bag and go yourself. Yeah. But, you know, having seen New Zealand, I would ha- be happy, happy to go back. I wouldn't go to South Africa because it's the longest trip for, that, that a person can take from <laughs> California to South Africa. It's literally the longest uh, distance and time that you can, that, that it's a, like a 52 hour travel day. Yeah. So that I'm not going to do again, unless I go on safari, <laughs> but, but doing the, but doing those movies and, and it was fun to hang out with the Canadian crews and the, and the crews of the different, of the different uh, countries. That's awesome. And you learn accents and you learn, <laughs> you learn dialects and you see, you know, jackass penguins and <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Well, when y'all went to South Africa, where did y'all actually film? I used to live in Johannesburg. Oh, wow. No, we were, we were in Cape Town. Oh, beautiful. I loved Cape Town. Did y'all get to see the point and everything at the ocean? And Oh, yeah. We went down to, uh, to what is it down there? Uh, Cape Point. There? I think it's Cape Point. Cape. I could be wrong. Yeah, it, it's, it's been whatever the Cape is. We went there. Yeah, we went down there with a uh, with our with a with a guide, and uh, you know, I mean, to you, who, who, it's a wonderful thing to be able to say. Yeah, I went to the to the Cape to the Cape in South Africa. Yeah, I mean, it's just nice to be able to see that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I lived. And uh, Cape Town is really interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, where Johannesburg is, it's about I think three to five hours north of that but it's kind of like the dallas metroplex you know but uh cape town is more like their houston uh texas so it's it's a beautiful area and i'm glad you guys got to shoot down there but it's just kind of wild that y'all were all over the world in vancouver and uh in um new zealand as well which is crazy cool i mean like you said what kind of experience do you get to work on a movie franchise like that and film in three different countries around the world you know yeah so, yeah absolutely i mean I, I was Every time I, I look at a movie and see and see him go from, oh, you know, Venice to Istanbul to to, to Paris to London. I mean, I'm saying, Jesus, these are these are lucky <laughs> guys. Yeah, right. And, and I was kind of lucky in a, in a smaller way, but yeah, it's 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 a, it's a it's a fortunate thing to be able to do. Well, I totally agree with you. You know, some of the other shows you've worked on that have been uh, pretty awesome are like Walker Texas Ranger, Girl Meets mm-hmm. World, and you worked on the movie Congo, I believe, as well. Is that right? I did. I did. Uh, I had done arachnophobia for Frank Marshall and had a great time doing that. That's awesome. And then Frank called me and he said, they need somebody to show that there can be a little bit of humor in the movie. <laughs> so, uh, so, and he asked me to do this a couple of days on it. And I said, sure. And I worked with, I forget her name. She's an actress. She's Robert Zemeckis' wife. And we had a little scene together. Uh, and it just, just to, to try to get a couple of chuckles so that the audience would would say, oh, it's okay to laugh at, at, at a moment or two in the movie. It's not all, you know, serious yeah. and, and horror. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that that was great. It was, uh, it's you know, to, to work with, with the Spielberg people and Frank Marshall, is, it's always a treat. That's awesome. Well, I've only gotten to see that movie, I think, two or three times, and it's all been on VHS. I haven't bought a digital or DVD copy of it yet. But when I saw that, I was like, no way. I haven't seen that movie in forever. But it was one of those movies that was just very unique, the, the the look of it was unique, the feel of it was unique, and I even thought to myself rewatching a trailer before we interviewed today, like, man, I wish movies like that today still existed where they're just a one-off, but they're amazing, they've got cool visual effects, and not all the CGI stuff that we have to have nowadays, you know, yeah. it just there was just something raw and unique about it that was like, man, I miss that, you know, and The Congo was a pretty fun movie, even though it was kind of a scary thing, you know, throwing that little bit of humor in there does help lighten the mood, because it gets kind of kind of intense <laughs> it gets kind of intense people get killed and yeah. blah blah blah, blah. Yeah. but it's it's awesome and it's that old gore it's that old sci-fi like indiana jones kind of you know it's the typical spielberg type stuff that you see from some of those lucas spielberg combos and stuff throughout time so right and, and i think you're right they used 
from my memory of it, very little CGI. That and like arachnophobia, yeah. very little CGI. I mean, they just whatever they did, they did. I mean, it was guys in gorilla suits and real spiders and blah, blah, blah. And then, <laughs> more practical no, effects and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Absolutely. And that's what I think makes some movies like so amazing, like getting to CGI some days. It's almost like I wish we could just go back to what we used to have, because sometimes they were more realistic and in, in, in a way, I guess, you know. Well, I, I'm with you, my brother. I mean, it's like I, I'm I enjoy like I saw Mission Impossible the other day. I, I really enjoy that. And I enjoy some of the other, but sometimes you just sit there and you say enough already with the, with these strange and, and, and repetitive and, you know, special effects, you know, something, just yeah. give me a good story, you know, scare me or don't scare me or make me laugh, but you don't have to have, you know, meteors crashing in the buildings and, <laughs> and, and giant yeah. monsters, you know I mean? Every time. Like, yeah, like, yeah. I, I just remember War of the Worlds. I mean, that had, I'm sure it had special effects, but it was so, you know, the old War of the Worlds was, was was visceral when, yeah. when, when you when you saw it and nowadays people and the more you use special effects and cgi the more you need yeah. i mean and you have to go bigger and bigger and bigger and i i'm convinced that now you can you can do everything and anything with cgi you can make people believe and create anything yeah and i mean anything uh and sometimes sometimes uh, um a more limited uh field gives you makes you be a little more creative yeah because you don't have that so in the old days they didn't have that so they had to rely on the actors they had to rely on the story now you know most of, i saw a movie the other day and i don't i don't remember what it was it was on cable some very good people and there was i mean if there were five lines in it it was mostly people shooting up monsters and stuff it was like <laughs> i i don't care anymore yeah. you know i just don't care yeah Anyway, that's just me. No, I totally get you. I totally hear you. Um, well, thank you so much for diving into some of those um, aspects of, of the Congo. That was a really fun movie. And if people haven't seen that, highly recommend it. It's a classic film and uh, cool. worth worth a watch. Uh, you know, some of the animated projects you've worked on have pretty much been everything I've ever watched that you've been involved with. <laughs> uh, and even if you've been a one-off or a couple of episodes, you've been in uh, shows like the animated Aladdin, the TV series yep. that came out, the Zeta project, yep. uh, Batman, the animated oh series, God, yeah. Batman beyond Batman beyond the animated movie, Superman, the animated series, animaniacs, the mask, the animated series that was based off of the mask movie with, um, um, Jim Carrey, I almost blinked right, out. Right. Uh, you were on All right. Real Monsters, Godzilla, the animated series. Yes, they made a Godzilla animated series back in the 90s. Everything had an animated series after it got a feature film, <laughs> including <laughs> Men in Black, which you weren't on, I don't believe. I don't think you were on Men no, in Black. No, I wasn't but, in there. Uh, you were on... But, but, uh... Go ahead, go I ahead. I be a lot richer considering all these things that I did. <laughs> right? Well, and then you were on The Angry Beavers, Cow and Chicken, and yep. Bonkers, just to name wow. a big wow. chunk of the ones you were on. I may have missed a few, but you, you've you been on so many different shows. And, and, you know, like I said, some of them were one-offs. Some of them you were in a couple episodes. Right, uh, right. And some of the series, like the Batman projects and Superman, you kind of came back as different characters through those franchises. Um, That's so exactly right. It's really cool to see that you've been – a part of my childhood through all of the films and TV and, and animations and everything you've done, because um, you've really been a part of everything, whether, you know, you were the biggest character or not, you know, so I just wanted to say thank you, Stu, for being a part welcome. of my it childhood. It was a pleasure and... dragging you into manhood. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, well, you know, and, and those things are still things I watch to this day. And when I have my own kids, I will definitely share with them because, you know, a lot of those things hold a, a special place in my heart. And oh, I don't cool. know, there's just something about the shows from when I grew up that I just don't know about some of the shows today. And I really miss some of the classic feels we got from like the older animated shows in that era in the nineties and early two thousands and, you know, Xenon and those. And I would love to share those with my kids and others to uh, show them That's great. what That's classic great. TV is all about. <laughs> well, when I was, when I was younger and my, my son was very young. I mean, I, I, I showed him Disney. I mean, that's what yeah. I showed him. The old classic Disney uh, movies or, or the Disney you know, I don't know about cartoon. Yeah, I must have shown him cartoon. But that's what he, that he didn't. And and it actually, was ironic. There was a oh god, I'm getting so old. I don't remember. <laughs> it's there okay. Was, there was a freakazoid. Freakazoid. Yeah, freakazoid. Yeah. Uh, was 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 almost appointment TV for me and my son. And then ironically, I did 
uh, a pilot called Superdog and Mr. Monkey, written by the guy who did Freakazoid. Really? The pilot never went, but I said to myself, well, Jesus, it was very good. And I said, if it's it's half as successful as Freakazoid, I mean, I'm going to have a job for a while. That never happened. But it was kind of funny that my son and I used to watch (laughs) Freakazoid. And uh, and then I worked with the guy that that created it, so that was nice. That's but awesome. yeah, I, I know what you say. I'm very happy that you're gonna, you know, show your kids uh, some of the some of the classic stuff. To be honest with you, if somebody asks me, and I do, I tried it to to do voiceovers. Now nowadays it works as that with actors you do them at home and you send them in. But you know, I, I don't know any of. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> I just don't know what these shows are. Yeah. I don't. I don't watch them. I, I, you know, you read them. You read the copy, and you and you try to do the best you can. But I don't know. And to be honest with you, I, I don't really care about what <laughs> what's in animation today. I mean, I, yeah. I, I don't. If somebody said, "Okay, you're going to be on a Ranky Ranky with the Razzy Razzy," if that's you know, I, I, I'll watch it and see what's going on. But I just don't know what's going on in in nowadays in in modern a- in cartoons. Yeah. I don't know what kids watch now. Yeah. Well, I honestly don't know what half the stuff is anymore myself. And I used to be the kind of person that even as I grew up through the years, I would still try to watch things and kind of latch on to what was kind of current. But some of the artwork that's coming out of certain places have changed to the point where it's real sloppy. The shows are very like so fast. You don't really have time to even tell a decent story. And I don't know. It's just, there's just not a lot of like, you know, like Batman, the animated series and shows like that, that you've been on. They, they had such depth to the characters and the stories were amazing. And the music was amazing. And the fighting scenes were authentic. And nowadays you see stuff and you're just like, what did I just watch? It's like somebody took a bucket of paint, threw it on the screen and said, ta-da. And you're like, uh, (laughs) well, Batman, the animated, Batman, the animated series, that was another appointment TV uh, for me and my son. The, the, the animation was, extreme to my mind extremely clever and sophisticated oh, yeah i mean it's all it, it it rang back to the old max fleischer cartoons yeah. superman max fleischer cartoons which i which i loved i know that when my son got a little older he was into anime whatever the hell that is <laughs> it's japanese animation it's that different Gentleman, style. yes yeah. yes I, yeah, I do know i'm just trying to say <laughs> but but he he enjoyed that and then he grew out of that and now he's you know on to other things yeah, yeah. but yeah i mean <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to think as a kid, I didn't watch a lot of cartoons. I, I don't remember. You're much too young to, to, I mean, I'm trying to think back in the fifties or the sixties, what, what I would have watched. I, I don't remember. I don't think I watched a lot of them at all. Yeah. But I did enjoy when my son was old enough to, 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 to watch them, you know, things like Freakazoid or Batman or Superman. I enjoy the animation yeah. and especially Batman. I really, I really enjoy, I was very happy to be able to, to do that show because, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed it and I, I admired it and I respected him. Absolutely. Well, I've had an absolutely wonderful time talking with you, Stu. I have two final questions and we will wrap this interview up. Are you ready? I'm so ready. All right. The first of the two is what kind of advice would you give to a young aspiring actor or actress who's maybe looking at joining this world of acting and maybe specifically trying to kind of gear themselves towards voiceover? Uh, you want an honest answer? You don't want me to be a, a Pollyanna. Be, be honest. Yeah. Give us an honest answer. Okay, in, in the Screen Actors Guild and After SAG, there's 95% unemployment at best. Okay. You know, and voiceovers, to do voiceovers, as a friend of mine who does voiceover occasionally, he, he once said, you audition for them, and if, you're, if you get one in a hundred, you're, you're, you're doing really great. There's a handful of guys now in town, uh, a lot of whom I work with, some I haven't, who work all the time and the producers go for them because they trust them. You know, when we were doing dinosaurs, I, they always hired guys like uh, Jason Alexander and, and Tim uh, Curry and they're great guys. And I used to say to them, look, I know a lot of actors out there who can do voices. Why don't you hire them? And they said, well, no, 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 we want, we want names. We want some recognition. And that's what happens with voiceovers today. Yeah. Uh, you, they, there's a few people who do a lot of work and they're terrific. Jim Cummings and, uh, and uh, Charlie Adler. I mean, all these guys are great. But as far as if you're trying to be an actor and go into voiceovers, I'm just saying from the bottom of my honest heart, it's going to be a long road to hoe. Yeah. Uh, it's really hard to get a job. It's probably tough to get an agent because there's a lot of people. I mean, if <laughs> I looked on, on the computer once. There's a, there's a site that has actors who, you, who have their reels on it. There are hundreds of them. 
yeah. hundreds of them that have put little snippets of their reels. And when I say hundreds, I'm being gentle. I mean, there are probably <laughs> more than hundreds, thousands. I don't know what there are. Yeah. But there are tons of people who, who do this for a living or try to do it for a living. And, and they put their names on these our websites and they, they're happy to make 25 bucks a job. I mean, and that's not a living wage. And so I, I'm just saying, I'm just being honest with you. If you get the job, it's great. I mean, it's like anything in acting. When, when you get the job, it's terrific. It's getting, you should forgive me an old actor that I know. And it's true. He says, the, the orgasm comes when you get the job. <laughs> then, when you, then, then when you do the job, it's like, you know, all right, I'm going to look in for my next one. Let me get this out of the way. Yeah. But I'm just saying to your to your the kids out there who who might be listening, it's it's hard, uh, and there's nothing else I can tell you. I mean, you can there are voiceover classes, there are demo reel, um, you know, people who will do that, and you need all of that stuff. But having said that, having done all that, it's still going to be tough for you to 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 make a living as a voiceover actor in Los Angeles, let alone New York. Yeah. So that's my from the deep from the bottom of my deep blue heart. That's it. Well, I appreciate your honesty and, you know, letting people know that if they, if it is something they want to pursue, it has to be a dream that they're willing to pursue no matter what, because it is going to be a challenge, but it's, you know, not necessarily impossible, you, but you know. Yeah. And lots of times you can't stop them. I mean, actors today, I mean, you can't stop me. You can say what I just said to people and they say, well, no, 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 I'm going to do it. I'm going to, everything's going to be, <laughs> you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be the exception to the rule. I'm going to, I'm going to make a living in this business. If that person, great. if that person that we are talking about exists out there today, who is willing to say, despite what you're saying, I'm still going for it. That's the kind of people that need to go for voiceover is what you're saying. That's right. I'm saying if you can't not do it, if it's in your heart, you know, and if you're, a particular guy that has some great vocal qualities or, or uh, abnormalities, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and if somebody says, Oh my God, Charlie, you, you, that's a great, how did you do that? How do you, you know, then you should do it if you want to do it. Yeah. You know, I'm just saying that there, there's, um, it's tough. That's all I'm saying. That's how I I'll end that. It's tough. Well, thank you for being honest and sharing that with us, Stu. The last question I have for you today is, what is the legacy that you want to leave behind? I'd like to win the lottery and leave it all to my son. <laughs> I love it. Well, I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, <laughs> legacy, I mean, you just want to be have people when they when they look at you at your at your stuff say he did good work. I mean, he was a good actor. Uh, he he made people laugh. He made people cry. I mean, he did his job well. I mean, yeah. I, I'm I'm not going to change the world. I don't think many actors can change the world, although they they think they can, but they can't. Uh, I would just like my legacy to be uh, one of respect in the business for in, with my peers and my family and, and that the audiences that, that see my stuff enjoy it and say, Oh yeah, I like him. He's, you know, he's good. I, I enjoy his stuff. That'd be fine for me. Absolutely. Just a simple, but modest legacy. I love it, Stu. Well, I mean, I, I, I got nothing else. I mean, if I was a, if I was a, a doctor and could cure disease, that'd be a great legacy, but I'm not. So <laughs> what I, what I got, what I can do, I mean, you know, Aristotle says, uh, you know, art should, should entertain and instruct, but he said entertain first. Uh, uh, and, and that's what I, I mean, I think most actors would, that's, that's the power that we have. We can, we can entertain. Absolutely. And occasionally if, if we can, you know, and, and it has been in the past that, that, that some artistic works have, have changed people's lives. Uh, but for the most part, me, uh, I would just like to be able to, because I do mostly comedy. I said, I, I, I hope I make people laugh. I always used to say, if I can make just one person laugh, it's just not enough. I need to make you know, millions <laughs> laugh. Well, you know, you've definitely made me laugh when it comes to dinosaurs, for sure. That show, okay. just the facial expressions mixed with your voice. I mean, the stuff that happened on that show, they were just, it was super funny. I'll never forget it. And being able to talk with you Great. makes that kind of a project for me that much more magical the next time I get to watch it because we've spoken now. And I hope that's, that's always how I f hope my listeners feel about it too. When they get to hear 
a personal story and get to know the person behind the voice uh, that they actually feel more entwined and, and involved with a project when they get to hear that actor again in, in whatever it is, you know? Uh, so That's very perceptive, very smart. And you know, you say you're not a doctor, but they say that laughter is the best medicine. So maybe you have Who says that I want names. <laughs> So, you know, maybe some of the laughter you've brought people has healed hearts and brought smiles that, you know, took away a rainy day, you know? Well, you know, that's very sweet, friend. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're very, very welcome. Stu, it has been an absolute honor and pleasure having you on the show today. Really a pleasure on my part. Well, Stu, thank you so very much for being on the show today. It has been an absolute honor and pleasure having you. Would you please give us a special closeout today as Earl Sinclair from Dinosaurs? Sure. Oh, Earl Sinclair, absolutely. Uh, hi, uh, Trenton and everybody who's watching the show. It's been an absolute pleasure for me to be here with you uh, uh, talking on the, on the radio. Of course, I don't know what radio is. I'm a dinosaur. But uh, it's been an absolute treat talking with you. And I hope that the audience out there uh, appreciates it. And, uh, you know, go buy a dinosaur tape once in a while. It's a great Christmas present. Hi. This is Stuart Pankin as Earl Sinclair on Who Did That Voice? The best show ever. Watch it, listen to it, or I will eat you. Hey everyone, I sure hope you enjoyed today's final episode of Who Did That Voice with Stuart Pankin, the voice of Earl Sinclair from Dinosaurs. And if you did, please find me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, or I'm also available on YouTube. From time to time, I may still continue to post on different mediums, uh, but especially on YouTube. Sometimes I post old school um, theme song intros or funny videos or things that typically have to do with voiceover in one form or fashion so i hope you guys will still follow me on social media i will be around and i will answer uh, as soon as i'm able to um, i'm not gone forever but uh, you know who knows who did that voice may come back or something new may come in the future i don't know but uh, i hope you guys will stay connected with me please message me if you ever have a chance to just say hi i'd love to chat with you uh, but anyway thanks so much guys i've been your host trenton larkin and you've been listening to who did that voice Well, everyone, that's all the time we have for Who Did That Voice. It's been an absolute honor serving you as the host of Who Did That Voice and bringing you amazing interviews with the actors behind the voices. Thank you so much for being a part of the Who Did That Voice family, and I hope you will continue to listen to the show long after I am gone. Thanks, everyone, for joining us on our final episode. We hope you've enjoyed all the discoveries we've made together these past two years on Who Did That Voice. I am Michael Greco, your announcer. And on a personal note, I'd like to thank the host of Who Did That Voice, Trenton Larkin, for allowing me to be a part of his journey. When you meet someone who is as passionate about animation and voice acting as Trenton, you can't help but get excited by his joy. He certainly helped remind me of just how much fun my job really is. It's been an honor to get to know him and become his friend. So on behalf of everyone you interviewed, thank you, Trenton. And to everyone listening, from everyone here, we hope you enjoyed.